with that being said, uh, we'll kick off the show with our interview for today, and we have a very, very special guest, Mr. Jake Shuknik from Bulls Canada. Jake, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, so, Jake, uh, I just wanted to um, introduce you officially as, is it the Bulls Development Officer? Is that the right term? So close. So it's Bulls Development Manager now, as of April. Ooh. As of April. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on up. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I had that right, because uh, I often get those titles wrong. I, I get that a lot. And t to be honest, titles don't really mean a whole lot to me, because I'm still doing what it is I want to do. Like, I'm still doing mostly, I don't want to say the same job, but like, I don't know. A, a title is just a title as far as I'm concerned. So. Fair enough. So, Jake, for some of the people out there who may or may not know you, uh, just uh, give us a little bit of background on yourself. All right. So I'm 28. I uh, started bowling when I was like eight or nine up in Chesley, Ontario. I um, was sort of on and off the national team a little bit, uh, probably what, early 20s, I guess. But uh, went to school for sport management and graduated 2016 and got hired with Bulls Canada right after that. So I've been with BCB for just over four years now, I guess. Um, started out as just sort of like a one-year contract, technical coordinator, um, organized championships, stuff like that, and slowly building up the portfolio a little bit. So working with coaching, officiating, Bulls developments, obviously my title, so that's a big thing now of trying to really grow the game. So, so yeah, that's, that's me in a nutshell. Awesome. Yeah. Um, going along with that, what are some of the, the initiatives that you're working on now, especially with Bulls kind of on the hiatus or I guess just coming back? Uh, that's, there's so much going on, which is, it's funny because whenever I talk to friends or people who don't know like what I do on a daily basis, uh, they're always asking like, how are you doing anything right now? And it's actually like super busy. So during the off season, like every winter is when I'd start to work on like conditions of play or updating policies or just like updating content because during the playing season, it's way too busy to be able to do that. So I've been able to do that a little bit, but uh, obviously with COVID, we've been making a lot of um, return to play resources. So on our website, uh, bullscanada.com, uh, there's a whole COVID webpage with like a bunch of resources that we've put out in the past, I guess, three months now that COVID's been going on for here. I don't really remember. Um, but between like return to play phases, frequently asked questions. Um, a couple weeks ago, we did a webinar with Steve and Dig on insurance and waivers. Um, we meet with the presidents of each um, province. It used to be like bi, -bi weekly, now it's probably monthly, um, just to sort of help them out, answer questions, see how they're doing help out where we can um, but that's just COVID so then COVID aside uh, I'm also working with the University of Guelph on updating the Greens manual um, I'm working with you Daryl and a few other coaches on uh, seeing if we can move our coaching stuff into an online environment I'm um, hoping to work with you uh, Terry and a few others on updating our coaching content um, the officials committee has got a whole bunch of stuff that they're working on that I'm helping oversee a little bit um, and then we also have a development committee that's actually new this year. So we used to have a competition committee that looked after all the national championships. Um, but now we have a development committee that's looking at sort of developing the game for everyone. So it's not just about the players, but it's also about coaches, officials, clubs that are hosting, what have you. Um, so we've got a lot of work this year ahead of us for, for how we can further develop the game. So it's actually beneficial to everyone and not just a few. Um, I feel like I could probably go on and on about all the other smaller <laughs> things that I'm working on, but that's that's bigger picture stuff for now. I think that I'll stop there for now. That's a wow, lot of stuff, man. Definitely seems like you got a lot on your plate. Um, so with you being so busy, do you, um, I guess this year is a little bit different, but when you're so busy at work, do you get to have any time to actually get out and bowl? So the first year that I moved to Ottawa, I think I took like a full couple years off and just didn't bowl at all. And that was totally new to me because it, Ever since I was eight, every summer was bull, bull, bull. I remember like one summer, I think I played in like 62 tournaments or something. Like it was just Ooh. outrageous. Um, so then I took a couple years off in Ottawa. And then my last year that I was in Ottawa, I played in the district singles playdowns. And that was pretty much the only tournament I did. And then last year I started to play a little bit more. I played in provincials, played in Woba, played in a couple other random tournaments. Uh, so I feel like I'm slowly getting back into it a little bit, but definitely not to the extent that I used to be when I was younger. Uh, the one thing that I do every year is I always make sure that I'm at Woba. That's like my one guaranteed without fail. I'm going to be at that event, and that's that's it for me. Awesome. 
So uh, looking back at it, when when you were bowling and and growing up in Chesley and and playing in tournaments all over the place, I know you went everywhere. Uh, did you ever think that you would be where you are now, or even or even working in bowls? That's that's interesting. So growing up, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Like I kind of wanted to be on the national team, kind of thought about working for Bulls Canada, but like I didn't really think I'd be there. So when I graduated high school, I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I went to Guelph for computer science just because I was good at it and I didn't really know what else to do. But after a couple years of computer science at Guelph, I um, absolutely hated it. The <laughs> teachers were terrible and it was basically teach yourself and I was just not for it. So um, I switched over to Brock University and did sport management. And once I started school for sport management, that's when I started to think, you know, maybe I could like eventually either work for Bulls Canada or work for OLBA or like, you know, get into Bulls somehow. Um, and it's actually kind of funny. So in 2014, I guess, is when I first met Anna was the youth championships in Etobicoke. Um, I actually told her like the very first time I met her, like, hey, I want your job when I'm older. And so <laughs> she remembered that. And that's sort of how I got hired too once I finished school because she was like, hey, you've got passion you clearly want want this job more than most so um growing up i don't think i would have envisioned working in bowls but once i was in university for sport management then i sort of saw that future do you enjoy working in bowls or would you rather be in a different sport uh, i really do so that's that's interesting so the first couple of years i i struggled with it because um i don't know how to put this lightly but um the clientele of bowlers are um they have a lot of negative things to say, I guess is the nicest way I could phrase that. So dealing with uh, the thousands of bowlers who just love to complain all day, that, that wore me down. I'm not going to lie. The first couple of years, I, I hated that part. So I, I thought about quitting several times. But now that I've sort of got past that and sort of got into my own groove where I can you know, develop resources and, and things have sort of improved drastically, now that I'm working from home, now that I'm where I'm at, um, people have asked me if I want to work for another sport. And right now i'm gonna say no like I'm, I'm really happy with where i'm at because it's really cool to be able to wake up every day know what i'm doing work for bulls have that freedom to actually help the game grow is is pretty cool um i know you said there you've been working from home i, I know that uh you've been at home since before this whole covid thing unlike daryl and some other people um would you do you um find working in an office space for you or working at home is actually better for me working from home is way better um not that an office is a bad thing, but for when I first got hired, I guess the first two and a half, three years, I was up in Ottawa working out of the office. And there's just so many other distractions going on, whether it's people coming into the office, whether it's just chatting with your coworkers, whatever it is. So it's hard to really just put your head down and get stuff done. But now that I'm home, I'm fortunate enough to have like a home office so I can just shut the door and put my head down and go to work for six hours and get whatever I need to get done. So for me, I find working from home's way better. I feel like I got way more done the first year I worked from home than I did like the past two years combined. Wow. Um, but that being said though, like it does sort of wear me down a little bit. So the, the non interaction with people slowly starting to get to me, especially with COVID because like there are days where I just never leave the house and never see anybody. So like, I feel like I'm not very socially active at all anymore. Right. Yeah. I I've been uh, working from home in this office as well and doing the podcast and doing everything else, which, uh, uh, I can I can agree with you. It, it sometimes isolates you socially from doing a lot of stuff. But uh, yeah, absolutely. But good for you for for continuing to work and continuing <laughs> to do stuff. I mean, that list is massive of stuff. That's pretty impressive. I'm not gonna lie. So, so with all the stuff that you're doing, um, what's what's the best part about your job? Ooh, that's that's a doozy. Uh, best part of my job. Um. Non bulls related, I'd say working with all the other sport organizations I get to. So, um, this year, one of my friends who works for wheelchair basketball started like a small national sport organization, like chat group. And so now like every couple months, we'll just sort of chat about what each small sports doing and developing. And so being able to actually see what other sports are doing is kind of cool. Um, I've got contacts in like so many other sport organizations now that if I wanted to 
at some point in the future leave Bulls and work for another organization or go and volunteer for another organization or whatever. Like now I actually have some of those contacts. So that's kind of cool because growing up, I don't think I ever would have been able to say that like, oh yeah, I know somebody that works for like Canada Games or Commonwealth Sport Canada or whatever it is. So so that's pretty cool. Um, Bulls related though, favorite part of the job. Honestly, I'm going to say it's probably developing resources that actually help like clubs. So last year or the year before I started working on a club development workshop to try and like help clubs grow. And that just sort of took off. I didn't really expect it to, but um, there's clearly a need for people to learn how to like run a bulls club. And so started piloting that last year. I think I went to like six clubs in Ontario just to run like a full day, like here's how you can grow your club. And that's just sort of spiraled into so many other things. And now I've been working with like, Bulls Scotland and a few other like Bulls countries on like how to develop resources for clubs to actually help help them grow. So I'd say that's probably my favorite part just because it's it's new and it's like I almost see like an immediate impact as soon as I like do a pilot of the club workshop, then like immediately afterwards I see like good things coming. Oh. Well, let's go outside of work for a bit, Jake. Um I like to ask everybody who is a bowler, um I know you've competed at lots of tournaments in Canada, around the world. What do you think um, is your favorite place you've ever bowled or your favorite event you've ever been a part of? Uh, probably Gold Coast Australia. Um, playing at Broad Beach was Classic. the greatest. <laughs> yeah, like I can't say that I've gone to many places other than uh, Arizona, Hong Kong, China, and Australia are really the only three places outside of Canada that I've played in. Um, but Gold Coast was the greatest just because of like the environment. I feel like I could have been on that beach for like months and I can understand why Ryan's there now because it's it's absolutely scenic. Um, yeah. the, the World Youth Championships was a pretty cool event. So I played in that and I think it was 2015. Um, that was really cool just to be able to compete in an event with like your peers, like people who are your age, give or take, um, make those connections. So like I still talk to my buddy from Ireland once in a while or the guy I played with from the USA once in a while. Like wow. making those connections is pretty cool. Nice. So let me let me bounce off of that one. So uh, take internationally out of it and, and maybe not just the best one, but you've been to a lot of small clubs uh, in and around Ontario. And I know there's some hidden gems out there. What's one of the ones that you think people haven't seen that is a really good club or a great place to go uh, to bowl? Ooh. Um, That's a heater, Daryl. <laughs> so it's just in Ontario, uh, I'm going to say West Lorne. Um, wow. So that's right. like down past London, little one, like eight green, eight rink facility, super small. Uh, they, they use fertilizer, like it's nobody's business there. I remember when we were there, the grass was super green and super long, but super flat and like had so much potential. And uh, I think the membership at the time, the year that I joined was like eight people. So like it was super small, but it was, it was really quaint. It was definitely a place I'd never been to. I can't say I'd like plan a trip to, hey, let's go to West Lorne. But yeah, um, yeah that, that's probably the first one that comes to mind for like a small small club that most people have never heard of or have never gone to awesome i've never even heard of it before that's really cool i remember i remember in their washroom they had uh i think it was like a mirror with like a playboy logo on it and i was like what is going on here <laughs> so it just sort of like really caught me off guard what was going on at that club <laughs> oh, man. uh so we have actually well derek dylan's always in chat but um hi there he has a question uh, mm -hmm. How does Lombos move from the current status in Canada to one that uh, may be on the level of athletics or of higher profile sports, for example? How do we take the next step? <laughs> um, well, there, there's a lot of different ways I can answer that. Um, getting more money into the sports, obviously the right way to go and to put it into high performance. So when I'm looking at sort of updating the coaching content and seeing how other sports um, deal with their coaching and how to go from grassroots club level up to high performance, seeing where we're not at with uh, like everything coaching related and all the rooms for improvement there. I think that coaching is probably the easiest example of where we can move to. So I know from growing up, I didn't really have a coach and looking at all the bowlers that I play against the tournaments, like they don't really use coaches. So I feel like coaching is the most obvious step to move up to like a, a better high performance program. Um, looking at not having like a, a high performance director or someone to actually just sort of like manage just high performance to deal with that is 
is an obvious step. But then in order to get there, I feel like you really do need to grow it at the grassroots level first. And so that just sort of brings me back to having the right leadership at the club to actually grow your club so that you can have more than just 50 members. Um, so you can actually get, you know, people to come in and drop in off the street and try it and get hooked. I honestly feel like at some point my vision is to try and make it so that every club in Canada has a membership of like 300 plus, but then also has like 5,000 drop in people playing each summer. So that's sort of where I want to uh -huh. get to, even though that's probably not going to be for like 20, 30, 40 years down the road. But that's sort of my vision of where I'd like to get to. And I think that if we did that at the club level, then that everything would just sort of naturally flow up to, to make the high performance program better and make bulls more, um, in line with other like top rated sports. Just speaking on that a little bit, Jake, I know you said something there about how coaches can be a big step. Um, do you think having something like how they have in tennis and golf, where you have your golf pro at your club or your tennis pro at your club, do you think something like that in bulls would be beneficial? Absolutely. I, I think that every club should have like multiple coaches and ideally some sort of a pro, whether it's a golf pro or bulls pro or whatever it is. Um, yeah, I think that would make a huge difference, especially because um, not that every experience is going to be like mine. But I remember when I first started bowling, we went into um, some guy's basement and watched a black and white video for like four hours before we even got to go on the green. So <laughs> not exactly the most encouraging way to start off your introduction to bulls so i know that a lot of clubs are like trying their best and they're doing what they think is best but if you had sort of like that paid pro person that could actually teach you and get you excited and sort of coach you along the way i feel it uh, it always makes me wonder how much better i could have been if i would have had like a really good coach at a young age to actually teach me how to do this that and the other right. I, I know last year i actually started working on my drives because i've always been terrible at that and I watched some of Vester's clips and how he holds it because he holds the bull differently when he throws a drive compared to a draw. And just thinking about little things like that, like I've been playing for almost 20 years and I've never really been taught how to throw a drive. Like that just sort of bamboozles me. We'll have to bring back the uh, the Michael Petuli school of drives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he knows a thing or two as well. Yeah, shout out, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the development in Canada... Uh, I know that every province is kind of on a different level when it comes to coaching, when it comes to playing. Um, you see players coming out of certain provinces that are, like a group of them are really good. And sometimes it's not all, um, it's not consistent. So, you know, Alberta may have a group that comes up and then Saskatchewan has a group that comes up. And then for some reason, you know, Nova Scotia has a group. Um, is your idea to try to start to level that out where... Um, Ontario and Nova Scotia and BC are all kind of doing the same thing as far as coaching and developing and we can just see that constant flow uh, from Canada rather than just groups popping up here and there. 100% and you sort of hit the nail on the head with making it sort of consistent across the country. So that's one of the reasons why like we're updating our coaching material because when you take a coach workshop, it should be the same whether you're in Ontario or BC or Nova Scotia or wherever you take it. Same with like how you learn the game and how you develop. Like it shouldn't really be that different province to province. Like learning the game is learning the game. So um, ideally it would be nice to see sort of consistent development coming up across the country. And that sort of ties into our regional coach network that uh, we just sort of came out with can't remember how many weeks ago, but uh, the idea is try to sort of connect the national team coaches with grassroots clubs. So that way, if anybody does want to, you know, aspire to be on the national team, then you can reach out to the regional coach that's in your area and say, hey, how do I get on the national team? What do I need to do? I can work with you to develop your skills and make sure you're doing the right things, entering the right tournaments and practicing on the right things that you need to. So that way you can actually get, get where you want to go to. So, yeah, I absolutely would love to see consistent development across the country. It's, it's easier said than done right now just because there is such difference between each province for who's got coaching, who's got time, who has any juniors to begin with, or people that are actually aspiring to be on the national team or right. anything further. So it's, it's tricky, but it's a work in progress. Do you also... Um, oh, I don't know how to word this, but uh, do you also see any um, preconceptions of Bulls Canada? across across the nation i guess um there's a lot of history behind bulls canada because obviously you've <laughs> been there for a very small percentage of time compared to how long it's actually been in in place but um do you see any preconceived ideas of what bulls canada is what they do compared to what you actually do 
Yeah, at, all the time. It's That's actually really funny. So when I first started with Bulls Canada, I would constantly have people coming up to me at national championships who I'd never heard of, never met, complaining about how in like 1982 they didn't get selected to play for Canada. And I'm just thinking like, I wasn't even born yet. What does that have to do with me? Uh, so still get that from time to time of people just coming up with their old grievances from whatever happened back in the day and it, it's so hard to get people to recognize that you know whatever happened back then rightly or wrongly that's that's the past that's not what we're doing today so i still get people coming up at national championships or wherever i'm at an event saying like oh you guys just hand select the national team it's fixed or whatever and we're just thinking like well no it's not like the criteria has been on our website we're transparent about it as best as we can be and other countries have actually even taken notice um, i'm not sure if i should really be saying this but i know that bull scotland's actually used some of our um, selection criteria because it's like a best practice for what we're doing it's on the website it's transparent so um, preconceived notions are difficult because a lot of people don't want to forget the past but i'd like to think that in the past four years all the people that i've met that have never um, like seen before never met before don't have those preconceived notions uh, coming into it now like their first interaction whether it's with me or anna or whoever are now just instantly positive and are like oh yeah bcb is great because i went and i talked to jake and he said blah 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 and it was a good time so I, I think we're slowly changing that but changing culture is is slow there is no quick fix for that so i i still feel like even if i'm here in 10 years from now i'll still be getting some people to come up with those uh, negative complaints about back in the past, but it, it's getting less and less. So a lot's changed in the past four years from when I first started. Do you get people interacting with you any differently now that you are actually an, a BCB employee rather than just one of the bowlers from Northern Ontario? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's interesting. Actually, I, I've had many thoughts about shutting down my Facebook account and making a work one and a private one because <laughs> uh, having so many Bulls friends before I started working for BCB, uh, I want to say I have like a thousand friends and at least like 750 are like strictly bowlers and so now i'll sometimes wake up at like 2 a.m to a message of someone asking for like the conditions of play and i'm just like what are you doing like it's not a work hour right now i'm not sending you that right now so um th they do treat me a little differently in the sense that now instead of uh seeing me as like jake the bowler it's more like hey jake you work for bcb can you get me whatever it is that that they need so um so that kind of sucks sometimes uh but uh it, it's not that bad as far as um, being treated differently. It's not like they stay away from me or shun me or anything like that. So I wouldn't say that it's it's a negative thing necessarily. Uh, Derek has an interesting question here. So it says, uh, well, not a question, it's just a statement. Uh, Jake needs to add some excitement in his voice when commentating at Nationals, especially if Greg <laughs> Wilson's lead is on fire. Well, I mean, if Greg Wilson's lead was ever on fire, maybe I would have some excitement to my voice. But uh, it, it's funny that uh, that Derek brings that up just Shots because uh, I've been commentating since 2016, I guess. So that's what, three, four years now I've been doing this. And I'm, I'm not going to lie. That's probably my least favorite aspect of the job now is commentating. Wow. I've watched so many bowls um, from national championships, all the events I've been to, that it's, it's hard to commentate on just because there is so much downtime and people play so slow in Canada that sometimes it's just hard to keep conversation going especially when it's a seven day event and you've been commentating for 12 hours a day by the time you get to day seven you're just like your voice is gone and it, it, it's hard to do so uh, I would love to be able to hire that out to a pro and bring in someone who's actually a professional commentator to come in and do that for me instead but uh, yeah that's that's definitely a, a personal development area for me if I were to actually pursue a career in, in commentating I, I know that my voice is pretty monotone and flat that I can I can work on that for sure I'd be curious to see if you did ever get really excited and maybe a little loud, like some commentators do in other sport, how well it would go over with the rink next to them, especially if someone's having a bad game or something. That's actually been the trickiest part about streaming is that you want to be close enough to the rink so that I can actually see what's going on, but you don't want to be too close so people can hear. And there have been a few times where I've sort of said like, oh, that was a terrible shot choice. And the player turns around and looks at me and then I'm just like, oh, my bad. Like, didn't know you could hear me. So, <laughs> so that, that's, that's kind of tricky because like I, I want to, you know, call the game, but at the same time, I don't want to be getting in people's head while they're playing. Like, I don't want to be telling them what to do either. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, Derek Dillon again. Uh, does Jake job does Jake's job allow him to focus more on being an athlete and getting back towards being on a national squad? That's so that's interesting. So when I first got hired, I was technically on the national squad. I think back then there was like an A squad and a B squad. 
squad or something like that, and I was on the B squad. I can't remember, but um, as soon as I got hired, I just sort of let my like membership, I guess, like expire. Like I just didn't reapply. I just sort of let that fizzle because I figured it looks bad to be working for BCB and on the national team. But Anna was super accommodating, and she was like, "No, you should definitely apply." But I was like, "No, nah, it just looks bad. I don't want to." But now that I've been here for four years, I've actually thought about that. And last year was sort of my first crack at seeing if I could. So when I played at the Canadian singles last year. Um, I found that to just be the most draining thing I think I've ever done. So after working for a week at Burlington for the majors to then go and try to play singles immediately afterwards, I had no energy left whatsoever. And then even when I was in the middle of a game, I remember specifically I was playing Steve Pizanson and we were like 16, 15. And I was thinking about something work related. I think it was like, did we write a press release for like the singles? And I'm just thinking like, why am I even thinking about this? I'm on the mat right now. I shouldn't be thinking about work, but it was just so hard to get my head not out of work because that's what I've been doing for the past four years is just organizing events. So that's where my brain was at. So um, I know that uh, I probably could apply to be on the national team and I could try to go through that process again, but I don't think I would want to right now just because I don't think I'd be able to separate work and being on the development team or the national team or whatever. I, I just don't think I'd have the energy to be able to do that, to work nine to five bowls and then go and have more to practice bowls. and go to a <laughs> and go, yeah. Bowls, bowls, and more bowls. Yeah, I guess, when, I guess when you look at it that way, it might be nice to not have that extra um, stuff going on, have a little bit of break from the sport, maybe do something else. Mm-hmm. Uh... Cameron, uh, who doesn't want to bowl with me? You should apply. Right? <laughs> I mean, I did bowl with Cam once at Woba, probably, what, 10 years ago now? Maybe not quite. Nine years ago now. Um, I want to say we won, like, the A-Flight Finals or something like that. So I bowled with him once. He's a good guy to bowl with. But uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll wait till Woba next year if, uh, if Cam comes back this way, and maybe I'll bowl with him then. Wow, you're going to ditch the boys? Oh, oh, no, I didn't say that, but uh, <laughs> if, if the Saturday beforehand, if uh, Preston still has that, uh, was it a men's Paris tourney, then maybe I'll play with him in that. Uh, so I guess we can congratulate you on your engagement. Thank you, thank you. That's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, so we were supposed to get married on August 1st, so that's next weekend, and oh, wow. uh, obviously with, with COVID had to delay that, so the new date is uh, July 3rd next year, so got lots of time to plan for that. Um, I can see Derek's question there. Will I wear bulls clothing at my wedding? Uh, I, I'd like to keep the the marriage intact and not uh, get the <laughs> on the first day, so I'm going to say no to that. I don't think Tori would be a fan. Good choice. Yeah, good choice. I do remember you, Daryl, though, when you got engaged. I think that uh, you played bulls in a tournament the one weekend. You got married the next weekend, and you were back at a tournament the weekend after that. And I just remember being like, oh, good luck with your wedding. And then, like, two weeks later, like, oh, congrats on the wedding. Come back. <laughs> That was true, and we also got photos taken at the Bulls Club. So I mean, <laughs> my life is Bulls uh, centric <laughs> at times, especially during the summer. Which, uh, whether whether good, bad, or, or unfortunate, who knows? Right? <laughs> Fair enough. So Jake, uh, I like to always have. Um, a few pictures pulled from somebody's Facebook or, or Instagram or wherever I can find them. So I've got a series of photos that I want to put up and uh, I'll just transition to that now. And I'm hoping that uh, you can put some context behind them, uh, maybe where it's from, what it means to you as far as your Bulls career. So here's the first one, you and Terry Scott. Good old Terrence. So Terry Scott was... Uh... Oh, I want to say that I don't remember specifically when we started working with him as our national coach, but uh, I remember I was emailing him back and forth for what felt like months and months. And so when he finally came to Regina, um, that was the first time I actually got to meet got to meet Terry. So that was really cool to be able to you know talk to someone through email for several months and then finally actually get to meet him face to face. So at least now I know what he looks like now when I'm working with him. And so uh, he commentated a few of the games out in Regina with me. Um, it was really cool to, uh, to be able to see what he's like. He, he's a super good commentator. And it wasn't until after that Regina event that I realized that he also did the commentary for the 2016 World Championships, I think, uh, when they were in New Zealand. That's so right, if yeah. you go back and watch that on YouTube, uh, Terry's actually one of the commentators, which I didn't realize at the time, but I can definitely believe it because what he knows um, about Bulls is just unbelievable. So whether it's coaching or 
greenskeeping or just you know bulls development in general terry's a, a wealth of knowledge um one thing that really jumps out at me is that uh, at his club he doesn't allow you to have coke on the green because that's the one thing that'll like kill the grass more than anything else so like you can have a beer you can have whatever but if you have coca-cola like absolutely not you get banned so that sort of always jumps at me when i think of terry i'm like oh yeah don't have coke on the green daryl you'd best not play at his I, club i know i'd be banned right away <laughs> <laughs> How about this? World Youth Championships with Jake way in the back, if you can see him. Yeah, back in the back left there, hat and sunglasses. Uh, this was this was a super cool event. So this was, uh, I guess, my, my second or third uh, international event. First time at the World Youth Championships anyway. Um, super cool to be able to meet all these people, having known, like, none of them before we got there. Uh, Priscilla's in that photo, too. She was the only one I kind of knew going into it. But even her and I, like, I didn't know her super well at that time um but this event was just really really cool to be able to go in there and meet all these different people you're forced to room with um like three other people from random countries so i roomed with ireland usa and namibia um and like the hotel is like right across the street from the green so you get to like just walk there it's on the beach like that was just a, a really fun event um that was also kind of a challenging event for me just because uh had a had a coach um brought in for me uh and didn't quite see the eye to eye with him so i found that to be actually probably one of the most challenging events just to try to play while also having a coach that you're not getting along with so that was a, a good learning curve for me if i could do it again i probably would have done things a bit differently but um that was sort of when i really realized the the importance of coaching so when we were there um i remember when we were playing mixed pairs priscilla and i were against australia one of their teams and australia had like four coaches all of them had ipads they were all tracking and like keeping stats and everything and i was just thinking like man this is like one kind of intimidating to be playing against like this team that's got four coaches but then when i asked like the australian guy ben i was like oh like are you okay with this and he's like yeah they do it every game but like it's still super intimidating to like have selectors over your shoulder just tracking you as you go um but that just sort of introduced me to like the importance of coaching and being able to keep track of stats and actually look back afterwards and say like you played really well and here's proof or here's where you can improve on and here's proof is is a pretty powerful tool and i was i was looking at this picture uh when i pulled it off and it's amazing that uh this event and all the world use after that the people that are playing in them have either moved on to like a bunch of them anyway not all of them but a bunch of them have moved on to like national team um bulls coordinator jobs working at clubs uh like there's ryan burnett and kevin anderson who work at brad beach now and play a ton with ryan vester uh you've got caitlin inch who's on the new zealand uh national squad selena goddard um chloe stewart uh, uh christina i mean it's it's amazing the caliber of people that you actually played with it yeah it, it's really cool because when you go there you sort of know that these people are going to be on the national team you can see they're already sort of on that high performance track even though they're not representing their country but it kind of puts a feather in your hat when you can play them and in some cases beat them and be like oh yeah i remember beating that guy and now he's winning gold medals for his country at like the commonwealth games so like that's kind of super cool to be able to say that you got to play against them before they were where they're at now how about this I know at least one guy on there, but uh, who, are, who are these other guys? I'm not sure if I know that one guy on there, though. Without uh, any sort of facial hair, he looks pretty young. But, uh... so who's that guy on the left? I've never seen someone like that before. Yeah, me neither. Um, so this would have been the first uh, international competition, I guess, outside of a training camp. Uh, this was Hong Kong, and I think it was the Craig and Gower Cricket Club, if memory serves. I could be wrong on that. No. I IRC. Right? IRC, yeah, you're right. Yeah, IRC. Um, yeah, so this was the first event that uh, we got to play in internationally, aside from going to Arizona for training camp once in a while. So uh, there's Daryl, Greg, me, and Dylan, and that was that was a really fun event. Um, super nerve-wracking the first time you roll a bull at an international event when you've never done it before, but um, this was, I think, Greg's like third or fourth time, and so he knew the area, he knew everything going on, and like planned going in, kept stats while we were there so you could see them later. I think I might still have those two to um, go back and look at too, so that was super cool, but um, super fun event to be able to do uh, Hong Kong and China because they're both similar, both a little bit different though and to be able to wear the maple leaf is just really really cool i also really liked those uniforms too those pants were super comfy yeah hey i've still got them do you got the shorts too those were uh, I, I wish we had a photo of those <laughs> i might have the shorts but i guarantee they don't fit 
they barely yeah, fit that... then. So <laughs> were they like the old school Larry Bird NBA shorts or what? Oh yeah, <laughs> probably a bit shorter than that, but yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, short shorts, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so this is hanging up, or at least used to be hanging up back in uh, the Chesley Lombolin Club. Um, after I won, I guess it would have been the 2010 Canadian Juniors, uh, there was a, re a reporter who did a story on me, so she came down to the club and asked me a bunch of questions and, and took a photo. I didn't realize at the time that she was going to be taking a photo, otherwise I probably wouldn't have been wearing a Lakers jersey to the uh, to the paper, <laughs> and also did not expect it to be framed in the clubhouse either, so that's... Kind of cool. Um, I do, I do, I do remember uh, winning like both the 2008 and the 2010 championships, and how uh, special, I guess, how important that was for me. Just because um, I never really played in the junior program till I was 16, so like 2008, and then to win your like a Canadian junior championship the first year that you have a crack at it was pretty cool. Um, I remember in Chesley they used to actually have a sign on the outskirts of town that said home, like basically quoted that little plaque at the bottom there. So I used to think that was kind of cool. So I remember in high school, some of my friends would like stop by the sign and take a photo and be like, Hey, home of Jake, I'm here. So, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. And last but not least, how about this one? Oh boy. I have no idea where you dug that up from. You must have been scrolling through the timelines for a while. I don't even know how old I was in that photo, but uh, super young. Um, Luke, I remember back in the day, you used to look so much like your brother Jesse that uh, for the longest <laughs> time I couldn't tell you two apart. So if you were to show me this photo now, I still don't know if I would know if that was you or Jesse. But That's me. Uh, this, this would have been at the uh, the Midland Lawn Bowling Club, and I don't know if this would have just been a random junior tournament or something else but uh, based on the medal i think that might have been the uh, the drawn paris tournament maybe yeah i don't know if it was the one that they deemed like the provincial drawn paris yet or not but that would definitely would have been the same thing i remember that was kind of a unique event so you go in and half of you are sort of like determined to skips and the other half are leads and so you play a game and then the highest skip gets paired up for the second game with like the lowest ranked lead and you so you always have like a different partner each game uh based off how you did the last game so um based on the medal i'm assuming i must have done okay as a skip during that tournament but i, I couldn't tell you uh what year or what what event that was really yeah, i've got no idea but luke you have a lot less hair now so. oh i know i don't know what i was <laughs> thinking back there back then i think you should bring that back i don't I think, think you should so. grow that out I don't think so. Every time my hair gets a little long where the curls come in, I got to wear a hat. I can't deal with it no more. <laughs> so, Jake, uh, do you see yourself bowling more in the future? I know right now is just everything's up in the air, but um, I know people were so pumped to have you back at WOBA, um, to see you um, back playing with people. Um, and when you, when you came back, a whole bunch of other people came back, like uh, uh, Dylan Jacobs, who hadn't played in a while. So uh, what do you think your future is for actually playing Bulls? Uh, well, I feel like I'll always commit to playing in WOBA because that's just the funnest event. So I'll for sure always be doing that. But other than WOBA, um, I probably will play in the odd weekend tournament in Ontario. And for anybody watching outside of Ontario, they have like 7,062 tournaments a year. So, I mean, there's a million that you can play in. Jeez, you don't uh, count or anything? Yeah, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> I'm probably short on that. It's probably 12,000. I don't know. But uh, there's tournaments nonstop in Ontario, but I definitely won't be playing that many. So probably a few more. I could see myself maybe once or twice a month playing in a tournament in Ontario during the summer. Um, as far as trying to um, play more competitively, I guess, uh, I, I did plan on playing in the fours uh, with a few other people and see if we could make it to canadians for four so i could see myself doing sort of the team aspect maybe once in a while i don't know if i'd do that on a regular basis though um but definitely won't be playing in 62 tournaments a summer like i used to but probably more than just woba so maybe i don't know five to ten tournaments a summer i could see myself doing maybe that's fair um before i pass it over to luke to do his uh nice little rundown with you um i wanted to ask you one more thing is there anything that you want to tell those that are watching and those that maybe watch after the show goes live on YouTube. Um, what do you want them to know about development in Canada and what uh, you hope that they get from from the stuff that you do? Ooh, um, 
so for me, as I said earlier, my vision is all about growing the game and getting more people bowling. So uh, when I'm working with other countries or other sports or whatever, that's all I'm thinking about is how can we get more people bowling? How can we grow the game? And the one thing that's really jumped out at me is just sort of leadership. So to be on a club board of directors or a provincial board of directors, um, you don't really get a whole lot of training, at least I didn't anyway when I was on a board. And so I really had no idea what I was doing. So five years ago, I was on the Ontario Board of Directors. And I, I remember I was in school at the time for sport management. And even being in school, I had zero idea what I was doing, absolutely no clue. So that just sort of really hit home to me that like, if I'm in school for this and I have no idea what I'm doing, how is anybody else really handling this? And so something that sort of jumped out at me is that the most obvious solution to getting clubs to actually grow is to make sure the people running them and making decisions about them actually know what they're doing. So I've worked with a group called Sport for Life. And if anybody's watching, um, I'd encourage you to go and Google that because they have online courses. And one of them is called like good governance or board governance or something like that. And it's like a $25 course, but it teaches you how to be a board of directors, like how to be a director on a board. Nice. And I found that to just be like the most super useful thing I wish I would have known when I was on the board, because I remember when I joined the board, like I got next to nothing for training. I didn't really know how to do or what to do. Um, so if I would have been able to actually sit through that training, that would have made a world of difference. So for me, when I think about development and actually growing the game, the first thing I think about is like, who's making the decision at the club? And do they actually know what they're doing? So step one is to get trained so they actually know what you're doing. And then step two, um, I'm super passionate about making a plan. So like, where are you going? Um, I call it a strategic plan, but really it's like a four-year plan. So like, where do you see yourself in four years? Um, to the best of my knowledge, like I'm going to say probably like 90% of clubs in Canada don't actually have like a written, like, here's where we want to be five years from now. And it's amazing if you think about how much more successful you are if you just write something down. Uh, I've seen so many studies that like you're 60% more likely to achieve something if you write it down. So thinking about clubs, like if you want to grow your membership by 10%, then like just write it down, make that your goal for the next four years. And then how are you going to do it? So um, yeah, training and like actually having a plan for how you're going to get there are my two biggest passions, I guess, for, for development in those. Awesome. <laughs> All right, Sorry, I'm falling asleep over here. <laughs> uh, I'll pass it over to you, Luke. You can uh, do your rapid fire to, to end off the interview. Alrighty, Jake. I promise these ones won't be as hard as Daryl's questions. Um, <laughs> so let's just go with the one I usually use first, and uh, let's go outside of bowls for this one. Um, what's your favorite sports moment you've either been a part of or been able to see? Does TV count as being able to see? Because if yeah, so, yeah, 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 then uh, you can you can see the poster behind me of Kobe. So Kobe's always been my uh, sort of idol. So um, back in the day, I remember growing up, I I was still pretty young for his 2000 to 2002 run with Shaq. But um, 2008, 2009, 2010, I used to love watching those Lakers Celtics battles. I remember that being all about defense. Like some games would be like 66, 62 final score, like just real gritty game so watching up uh, growing up watching Kobe play with the Lakers was probably my highlight I don't know if I could pick a game or a season but just all of that nice um who would be your uh celebrity crush male and, and or female um I'm probably gonna go with the uh the power couple of Ryan Reynolds and Blake Lively um <laughs> <That's a good laughs> I, I, I love I love both of them so I mean take your pick either or um would you rather have coke or pepsi pepsi hands down uh coffee or tea coffee it, it's crazy i used to never drink coffee until i started working here for bulls and then now it's i can't go a day without waking up with coffee um i don't know how many more i got but i guess i'll finish it with this one jake if you're in a game winning scenario in a game of bulls are you driving or drawing uh, uh probably drawing all right perfect <laughs> well jake uh, we want to thank you for for being on the show uh it, we really appreciate it. It gives everybody a little insight into Bulls Canada, even just your little window of it. And hopefully the the stuff that you say and the stuff that you're you're producing for us while um, we're all trying to get back at Bulls um, makes a huge difference. And, and I, we give you all the props in the world for, for doing what you do day to day. Yeah, thanks a lot, Cool. Uh, appreciate that. Thanks, guys. I want to thanks give you both some thanks for uh, everything that you guys are doing. The show is great, and keep up the good work. Thanks, man. Thanks, Jake. We appreciate it. Have a good day, all right? Yeah, you too. See you, buddy.